Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Milton Keynes Lit Fest and to our Spring 2022 online programme. Uh, it's a very real pleasure this evening to welcome Alison Brackenbury, uh, who I will introduce to you shortly. Uh, as John has just pointed out, we are recording tonight's event, so it will be available to view again later. Uh, if you would rather not be seen on screen, by all means, turn your video off, although we and, and I'm sure Alison would, would love to see your smiling faces, uh, if that's okay with you. Uh, for most of this evening's event, as it is uh, fully illustrated, we will actually be sharing the screen, so most of the time you won't actually be visible in any case. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end of tonight's event. So if you have any questions for Alison about her writing, about particular poems, about the stories or anecdotes that she tells about our area as during the event, uh, please tap them into the chat window and we'll take as many of those as we can at the end. So I think that's, that's everything on the essential housekeeping. We all know how Zoom works. Uh, if you could keep yourselves muted throughout, that would be terrific. It saves us having to come along and mute you. Um, and let me introduce Alison. Uh, Alison Brackenbury grew up in a Lincolnshire village and is descended from a long line of servants and skilled farm workers. She moved along the limestone to a Gloucestershire town where she's lived for over 40 years. She's worked as a librarian and account clerk and a metal finisher and has been a parent, horse owner and custodian of too many cats, despite which she has published 10 poetry collections, of which her latest is Thorpe and S, which my iPad is refusing to show in focus. <laughs> I'll type you the details into the chat window. Uh, she's won Eric Greg Gregory and Chumley Awards from the Society of Authors and her work has been broadcast frequently on BBC Radios 3 and 4. Her last Radio 4 fe feature, Exploring Family and Life Through Her Grandmother's Recipes, was praised by Pick of the Week as delicious. So uh, a warm hand, please, as we welcome Alison Bracken. Welcome, welcome, Alison. While I find the slideshow, uh, slideshow, would you like to introduce yourself to our, our Indeed. Lovely... Yes. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you very much to you all for coming. First, I must apologise for the hat. It was my gardening hat. The hat is delighted by its promotion and almost runs to the computer every time I log into Zoom. I do hope to go back to my young hairdresser and hear the latest update on her new cat. Meanwhile, at least the hat is happy. We begin with a ditch. It is high on a hill in Gloucestershire, where I have now lived for over 40 years. It is a green hollow amongst beech woods, but like much in England, it is deceptive. For this place was a hill fort, and hill forts were a mistake. Excavations show that they ended in disaster. This hilltop, hauntingly, has never been excavated. I came here first on the warm and dangerous back of my first horse, the small and sturdy horse I bought with my savings when I was 28. He was utterly loyal and lethally spooky. Some people think that horses see ghosts, and he seemed to think there were a few up on that hilltop. I thought of telling you the date when the poem was written, but I think you may agree there are many years to which it could belong. The poem's title is the name of this haunting place, Norbury. I was almost hurled in the ditch for my first mad pony would switch from gallop to halt in one stride. Each ride he would swerve, fling me back to the deep tumbled gorge by the track. Dark beech trees hung on each side. A hill fort, no life but its name, Norbury mapped Iron Age. The same June wind conjured sweat, flies of course. I soothe the toss sun bleached main down by the dike, rough grave to the town, bones of child, wrecked fighter, 
course. What are 20 years to Hillwind? I trudge, horses outlived. I find the highest beach drought struck. A rich crest springs, orange fungus. Its throat gapes to the war trumpet's long note. The lost leader's last lying, which tumbled us all in the dip. I did not grow up among the ditches of Gloucestershire, but in Lincolnshire. Both my grandmothers, Dot and Amy Mary, who lived there then, were fine cooks and even better neighbours. But there was one item which neither of them ever made. The poem is called High Class Food. Both my grandmothers were of age to stuff fat sausages with sage, Lincolnshire's herb, which calms the blood. They could make dumplings sweet with suet, slash egg white with a knife till thick, plate shoulder poised, Victorian trick, but never dreamed of needing bread. They ran to baker's vans instead. Yet when strange men tramped round the farms to beg for work in 30 storms, Dot, between her jobs, would pour them tea beside her fire before sending them out in rain, well-fed, on home-cured bacon and white bread. Now, a short seasonal poem based on an unexpected taste on a rare return trip. The poem is called Lincolnshire water. Here is strong land whose grass does not spill foaming milk, where I still hear in February taps hiss cold silk. Life has its seasons. Although as an adult I moved into a town for 35 years my shaggy and unaffordable ponies lived on the Gloucestershire hills, on a friend's farm, where I could ride in the lanes and in the wet woods. Here is the last and perhaps most beautiful of our horses, who lived to be 31. But while I was deciding, finally, that I no longer wanted to risk my ribs to gallop, our last pony was losing her sight. This poem is called Going to the Yard on May the 19th. I will stumble up the paddocks where first mist blinds the air, past the crowds of nettles, the bonfire piled with chairs. She sleeps four square, alone as she must be. Startled in sun, her ears search dusk for me. I buckle the head collar. Her steps slow, she cannot glimpse hard gates I do not own. Summer's red coat gleams down her shoulder blade. She rests her head on me while I brush hard. Greets her filled bucket with quick toss of head. The yard's one robin flits to her spilt food. Horses stand quiet when fed. She stares at skies. No spring sun melts the cataracts from her eyes. I click my tongue. Each calm hoof lifts. Too soon, I clean each tender frog, the soul's half moon. Twenty-three years, her breath on my neck. Then the vet must come at half past 10. Next, perhaps the most sombre poem in this reading. I should add that I am still not without hope, but I was sober to realize that it was 50 years since the glowing picture of our earth was captured in space. 
I first saw this picture when I was a generally optimistic schoolgirl. I then bought it on a poster for the technical college where in my twenties I worked as a librarian. This is how it came back to me one morning before dawn when the BBC Six music DJ, Chris Hawkins, mentioned on air that he planned to make a music feature based on that photograph. Chris later broadcast the poem I wrote on that morning, so it is gratefully dedicated to him. The poem is called Apollo, 1968. They floated past the moon without a spark of radio, the quiet before birth. Pulsed by its cobalt seas, they watched the earth, its perfect O, rise trustful from the dark, as we wish children might without a mark. See South America, whose tides of white shield sloths, jeweled hummingbirds, which drink our light. I was too young, sucked into my own dark. At work in a tech library, an arc of students, I set blue earth on the wall, so it sailed to them, bold and beautiful. In drawers, the plans for wind power slept in dark. The blue sea rose, then drowned. We lost the lark. I never dreamed that we would reach such dark. Now, I think that we should have a tiny poem for this season and for a very different planet. The poem is called March the Fourth. I heave back the bathroom window. The catch is stiff and like me, old. I would like to let in the crescent moon. She is so slender and must be cold. And now I think it is time to climb on a bus again in the sun. The poem is called Wednesday on the 97. Like family you complain about, but love. I am at home with buses. This is prompt. At every stop it dawdles in the sun. I do not phone, read, talk. I simply sit. I watch deep sycamores dip to the south, as if the whole day is a cat that purrs, and I, the tongue, vibrating in its mouth. There is a less welcome sun in my next poem. Its subject came from the nomadic tribe of the Scythians from Siberia. I went to an exhibition expecting to be enthralled by Scythian gold work. But my eye was caught by a very different object. The poem is called Scythian Ice Burial. Sheepskin, goatskin, kidskin, sable. Underneath a warrior's shoulder lay the child's coat, unable to heat or thaw his grave's cold power, were small sleeves patched for him, a son fevered in one summer hour. They laid him carefully in trust, no spade could lever earth's cold lid, no sun would pierce ground's frozen crust. The glacier shrinks like all he did, Leaves his first coat, our last ice hid. Sheepskin, goatskin, sable, kid. Charles Dickens, I think, would have been fascinated by the ice burials. In 2019, before travel stopped, I went to see the house, which was the home of Catherine and Charles Dickens, in the early days of their marriage. I was startled to find that this modest building 
is Dickens' only surviving London house. I began to think about his long and changeable life and marriage. Before I read this poem, set in that London house, I must bombard you with facts, some of which I learnt on my visit. In 1851, under the name of Lady Maria Clutterbuck, Catherine Dickens published a book of meal plans. What shall we have for dinner? Is she his wife? Is the title of an early play by Charles Dickens. Dickens had a desk built for his reading tours. When illness forced him to stop, he planned to burn this. Catherine and Charles Dickens had 10 children. Dickens separated from his wife in 1858. In the last years of his life, he had a secret relationship with a young actress, Ellen Turnham. I have no more to say is the final sentence of a letter from Charles Dickens to his publishers, Evans and Bradbury. He quarrelled with them over their support for Catherine. The poem is called Charles Dickens at Home. Bonds, cranes made his grand houses mere rubble under feet but not their narrow first door, 48 Doughty Street. Kind Catherine clasped the baby. Dickens set up his desk. He rattled sherry bottles. She counted out the eggs. The basement stairs could break knees. Her belly twitched, stretched sore. Charles stared across the garden. Oliver asked for more. Slowly, Kate shuffled menus, sweet salvage of her life. What shall we have for dinner? He wrote, is she his wife? Spring soup, then vermicelli, the hospital fund, grey curls, oxtail, mock turtle, hair soup, the house for fallen girls. His favourite child was Katie who painted, laughed, dared turn to snatch the frail reading desk her father planned to burn. Behind his tallest last house, with Catherine packed away, he lit his bundled letters. I have no more to say. The profile of his actress shows tension, sharp-lipped grace not Catherine's muddled ringlets, not unlike Katie's face. We live in all our houses, ash whispers to the sleet, lime buds tap bedroom windows, upstairs in doughty streets. In the unaccountable absence of mock turtle soup, I'm going to leave the screen for a few seconds to drink some water. Do feel free to gaze at the poster above the fireplace. It's not genuine, but it's an El Greco showing, I believe, St. Martin sharing his cloak with the beggar. I'll be back soon. Hello again, I hope you can still hear me okay. I must mention that I am disgracefully active on the internet. I have a website with a contact page. Do look me up if you wish on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter, where you will find me with many nature photographs. Now for an interlude, which begins in a village. People who know me probably associate me with Lincolnshire, where I grew up, or Gloucestershire, where I have now lived for over 40 years. 
But I also have deep links with Buckinghamshire. My mother's mother, Amy Mary Wright, grew up there in a tiny village called Chichley, which some of you may know. She would say, I always remember. And there would be a flow of Chichley stories. I have been thinking about these because I'm working on the second draft of a prose book called Village. I often find myself writing severely. This is not a nostalgic book. So I must begin by telling you severely that I am not nostalgic for Chichley. Amy Mary grew up in the 1890s. It was a terrible time for British farming with a flood of cheap imported food. Does this sound familiar? One autumn, after a bad harvest with low wages, Amy Mary woke up in the night and heard her own mother crying. Emma was afraid that she would not be able to feed her kindly husband, Leonard, and their six children over the winter. But Granny Wright, as we called her, did manage to feed her children during that winter. And I knew almost all of them. Agnes Elizabeth, whom we called Mag, Arthur, Amy Mary, Edie, Sid, and their youngest sister, Bright Bertha, lived in Chichley in a thatched cottage. Now, I do not want to upset anyone who does not care for creatures with eight legs. But my grandmother told me with relish that they used to descend spectacularly from the thatch outside her bedroom window. I must thank today's visitors for updating me about Amy Mary's birthplace. I was touched to find that Little Chichley is still as friendly as when Amy Mary used to gossip with her Aunt Kit, lace maker and rose groom at the garden gate. The once battered cottage is still there, now beautifully maintained. And I am reliably informed that, although the last of the Wright family chose to leave in the 1930s, their spiders chose to stay on. This entirely spider-free poem comes from my latest collection, Thorpe Ness, published by Carcanet. I do apologise for taking you back a season, but I think you will see that Amy Mary was liable to produce the poem's chorus impressively at any time of the year. So here are four generations beginning in that cottage in Chichley. The poem is called, My Grandmother Waits for Christmas. Amy Mary, laborer's child, feared for food when harvest failed. What did her mended stocking hold when fat snow lit the house? An apple and an orange and a sugar mouse. Factories overtime revoked. Her children chose Marge or Jam. Christmas hopes at tea provoked Amy Mary's list. Her house hummed along. My mother sang and a sugar mouse. I met Christmas on the hop with fair trade chocolate. One lean year, a toy dog from the local shop in city suit, in our small house, suddenly my daughter chants, and a sugar mouse. Grey, with loot, I bounce the bus, at dawn in dream, before the trust presence rain descend on us. I nibble in that kind, dark house, on the crystal crust, of my sugar mouse. Most of the money for the mice came from the wages of Leonard Wright, who I was delighted to discover worked on a local farm as a horse keeper. Amy Mary was sent out by Granny Wright 
to carry her father's dinner to the fields at harvest time. Inside a muslin cloth was a long sausage shaped piece of steaming suet pastry with hot meat at one end and homemade jam at the other and an impressive wall of pastry in between. I do not have Granny Wright's Victorian recipes, but my new book is home to a small village of poems dedicated to my Lincolnshire grandmother, Dorothy Eliza Barnes, whom her family called Dot. When I knew Dot, she was a Lincolnshire shepherd's wife, but as a young woman, she had been an Edwardian professional cook. She left a black oilskin notebook filled with her handwritten recipes. Here is what you will find on the very first page. The poem is called Start. Page one, Aunt Margaret's pudding. Take half a pound of flour, three ounces lard or butter, egg, milk, sugar, baking powder, Spread jam in saucepan, summer glean, poke fire, for 90 minutes steam. Dot took for granted custard seas in which all pudding swam, yellow as straw, farm workers' food. In frost the men tramped home, moon glittered. No one knew how lard would lime and leave their arteries hard. When I came home, and you worked late, our workshop gloomed with cold. I bought flour from the corner shop, sacked cupboards for old bowls. Softly, the mixture dropped. I too spooned Margaret's hot jam sponge for you. The essays Amy Mary wrote to pass the test for leaving her village school was so outstanding that her teacher sent them to the squire, Sir George Farrer, who was then renting Chichley Hall. Amy Mary herself was not allowed to spend a penny of it. Granny Wright snatched the guineas from her hand and went off to buy new boots for the whole family. And Amy Mary went off, age 13, to be a rather disgruntled housemaid at Chichley Vicarage. Here she is, second from the left in the front row, looking distinctly rebellious. And who is the formidable lady in her best striped blouse at the back? Yes, it is Emma, red-haired Granny Wright, who would pack off Amy Mary's younger sister, Edie, to a job further afield by train. This is what happened when Leonard Wright, a much softer character, took his third daughter to the station. The poem is called Edith Leaves. There she was, my Aunt Edie, going off to service, scared and 14, crying by the side of the train. She did not want to be a maid, but to run straight back to the cottage, to her grim red mother, to the tall bean row where her taller father waited. So he, in his labourer's best boots, climbed with her on the train, then travelled to the next brief stop. Could he pay? Was he caught? Jumped down. She sat, still crying. How did he reach home? I know, he walked. The lane smoked dust. He did not see the hawthorns fresh and spicy leaves, cream heavy heads of elder. What use was that? Her mother said. You could have ridden all the way and she would still be crying. What would you be as the train shook by, as the pollen stroked his shoulder? The flowering may with its neat chopped thorn, the heady, weeping elder. Then came the First World War. In September 1914, Arthur, Amy Mary's older brother, 
was driven to the recruiting office in Northampton with seven of the villagers in Lady Farrow's car. By the end of April 1915, Arthur was dead. A month later, so was Sir George Farrow. I would not blame Lady Farrow for Arthur's death. I think he would have joined up anyway, perhaps cycling all the way to Northampton on his precious bicycle. His younger brother, my great uncle Sid, confessed to us that he defied Granny Wright, ran away and joined up under age. Sid survived. This, he told us, is what happened when he returned to his village and met Lady Farrow. The poem is called Meeting, 1919, between my great uncle Sidney and the wife of a Buckinghamshire squire. Well, right, she called in the raw wind, we heard that you were safely home. Now, I suppose, you'll work for us again. When, pantry boy, Sid stood at 1 a.m., still scraping grease off dinner party plates. I've had four years with sergeant shouting at me what to do. I've not come home to be bossed round by you. She turned for Chichley Hall without a word. Amy Mary's war was spent in Lincolnshire, where she had moved with her young gamekeeper husband now in France. This is her story of loneliness, discomfort, and perhaps something more. The poem is called, My Grandmother Said. It was the First World War. Her husband was away. So she knew fear, but also found new freedom in the day. On Thursdays with the farmer's wife, old basket on her lap, by butter slabs she rode to brig, shawled in the pony trap. Oh, how I envied her. I whined to brig by bus for school. No ponies dancing knees, first son in Elderbush. She would have crossed the Ancom, seen the canal glint wide. She could buy apples and white thread, jog home to New Moon's Ride. But I was frozen to my bones all winter. Was that all? My grandfather took up the reins. She settled in her shawl. In the 1960s, I sat in a warm council bungalow in Lincolnshire and listened to the stories both of Amy Mary and of her husband, Frank. Here he is in the uniform of the Great War. Unfortunately, my dashing grandfather, who had once been a smart gamekeeper in Chichley, was a walking definition of the term unreliable narrator. But I still believe some of his stories, including those about an animal rarely mentioned in accounts of the war. The poem is called Toll. Ask everything you want to. You cannot stay long. No one now will ever hear your father's father's songs. I heard both songs and stories from my mother's father's war. But in 40 years, he grew a joyful liar. He had seen every truce, the football and the mud. Stood, he said, a batman ironing to the great gun's thud. No one else spoke of the mules, led where no rail could run, of axles bubbling under mud, where useless wheels spun. So every story ended as his lame wife laid for three. Then the mule kicked the major, so we laughed and drank our tea. Then the mule kicked the major, so we laughed and drank our tea. My prose book, Village, which I'm currently revising, contains many 
discoveries, some startling, some sad, redeemed by the fact that I knew the cheerful and kindly survivors at the heart of these stories. Here is a final village photograph. Arthur Wright is the troubled looking boy in the center. I think my uncle Sid, my great uncle Sid is on the left. Those ears did not change in half a century. Leonard Wright, church warden of Chichley, proudly brandishes the church banner. This poem is a tribute to the kind and lost generation of my grandparents. The queen mentioned in the poem is Victoria. Leonard Wright, my great grandfather, the village's chief bell ringer, received a terrifying innovation, a telegram to say that she had died. The poem is called My Old. My old are gone, or quietly remain, thinking me a cousin from West Ham, or kiss me shyly in my mother's name. My parents seem to dwindle too, forget, neat ending to a sentence they began, beginning of a journey, if not yet. Cards from village shops were sent to me with postal orders they could not afford. They pushed in roots of flowers carelessly, and yet they grew. They said a message came to say the queen was dead, that bells were heard. My old are gone into the wastes of dream. The snow froze hard, tramped down. Old footprints picked with smoothness, blackened footprints that I tread, that save me falling, though they do not fit exactly, stretching out beyond my sight. My old are gone from name, they flare instead. Candles that I do not have to light. I would like to read you just four more poems. Before our Chichley interlude, we were with Charles Dickens in London. Let's return there a century later to an extraordinary meeting between two extraordinary musicians. And I can offer you something to look forward to. For in March next year, the building in which this meeting took place will reopen, restored to bring you even closer to this encounter. It is one of my favourite museums, called simply Handel and Hendrix in London. From 1968 to 1969, Jimi Hendrix lived in an upstairs flat at 23 Brook Street, next door to George Frederick Handel's long-term home. Hendrix admired the composer, who shared his passion for introducing dramatic new sounds into music. Jimmy claimed that he had met Handel's ghost, an old man with a grey pigtail wearing a nightshirt. Handel reputedly went blind because of the hours he spent copying out his music by candlelight. His huge meals were legendary. The poem is called Purple Haze. When Jimmy glanced into his small attic mirror while parting his lips and teasing his hair, in a candlelight glint he saw George Frederick Handel, alarmingly wigless, alarmingly there. What have you been taking? said Handel to Hendrix. Only the usual, Jimmy replied. I adore your high notes, Handel whispered. But listen, you cannot cheat sleep. I went blind when I tried. Make friends with your sound man, then fix the fuzz pedal. But discipline, boy, cut your endless tracks short. Jimmy shook 
his fine head. With no more breath to meddle, George sank to roast chicken, his cellars of pork. Now, a poem about a man who was never famous. He was one of the many farm workers in the Lincolnshire village where I grew up. But he lived surrounded by a strange glow of mystery and of respect. The poem is called Fur. Does anyone wear buttonholes? We made them for the village fate. So I was sent up to the gate of the old man who would have gone to grammar if they could have bought a crested cap, soft shoes for sport. He passed from village desk to farm. The one girl he had waited for ran to an airman in the war. His sister kept the tiny house. A courteous, clever man all said, in June heat at a long lane's end, through the blue gate on a grass path, I stepped beneath the rose's cloud. I saw him bend to stakes, head bowed, by billows of asparagus fern, for farmhand's collar or the queen, webbed, spread like hands, its tiny veins, crisp as dead leaf, all green, so green. I think that many of us recently discovered a small green kingdom very close to our home. I spent a lot of time on a footpath in a field just outside Cheltenham. Here I found the shells of oysters, a cheap food in Victorian England. And I found willow pattern, the china which shows the story of two lovers, one rich, one poor. After death, the lovers are reunited as birds. The poem is called Willow Pattern. Town's edge, a lane, a bridge, a field marched by the battered stumps of maize, lit by hills broad as the moon. The cracks in April's clay will yield rich oyster shells to feed poor days, pipes, pig skulls. Best we find soon smashed pottery. And most is blue, slipped from quick hands, a child's, a maid's, to floor. Were harsh words spoken? I brush a latticed rim, while you scoop one white scrap, whose two blue birds, smudged lovers, saw unbroken. We began with a ditch. Let's end with the sky and with the book's title. Thorpe Ness is a small village built ruinously as an eccentric holiday resort at the beginning of the last century. It is just along the Suffolk coast from Alborough, which I love and visit every year. This journey brings me back to the east coast to the south of my grandmother's coastal birthplace, where I meet again my old and fearsome friend, the North Sea. But when I wrote the final poem in this collection, I had never been to Thorpness. It had become the place where I always meant to go, but never reached. I think perhaps we may all have a Thorpness. So here is the last poem of this new book and of my reading. The poem is called Shingle. Will I get to Thorpe Ness? Well, not today, since my feet clash the beach the other way. A young brown gull veers, pipes, its thin cry of distress. All the bright screens cry rain. A mermaid's purse, a black pouch lies, fish eggs that deep sea nursed. Vainly I skim it back, 
Rain beats my nose and chin. In tall streets, no oh. clouds press. Three swallows snatch a gust of breath last cry. Small voices catch land's end, storm's edge, whirl high. Far, far beyond Thorpe Ness. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Alison. I think we should all put our hands together for a round of applause at the end of that splendid reading. You can unmute yourselves if you wish. <laughs> As, as we said at the beginning, Alison will, will now, uh, for the remainder of the session, take your questions, but I think there's something that she would like to ask of us as a starter, if I might remind you. Uh, that's lovely. Shall I proceed? This yes, is like a please. missing person appeal. I'm looking for Aunt Kit from Chichley. I must explain briefly at the end of the story that Amy Mary, my grandmother, first because of poverty and then because of terrible arthritis, rarely left Lincolnshire, but my mother, unlike her mother, went to grammar school, funded by Amy, Mary and Frank, went to London as a student, so she visited Chichley, and Aunt Kit was an elderly lady of whom my mother was very fond, and I know she lived in the council houses in Chichley at the end of the Second World War. There's some more stories floating around about a lady who was a lace maker, who was a rose grower, who lived in the thatched cottages at Little End in Chichley. That may also be Aunt Kit, but I don't think she was a blood relation. Her surname may have been Wright, but there are various things I would love to know about her. I'll just tell you briefly that she told my mother at the end of the war that she wished she could fly up to Lincolnshire to see Amy Mary, whom she must have known as a child and a young woman. And she said she'd like to gossip with her and laugh. And she said it would be like old times once more. I think that's like the song of old Chichley, old times once more. So if there's anyone out there who might know of Aunt Kit, might be a descendant, um, do get in touch. My website has a contact page, Alison Brackenbury. I would love to hear from you. Hey, um, I can see from the chat that Caroline Davis has a question for you. Caroline, would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask Alison? Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Thank you, Alison. That was absolutely wonderful. I um, really you. enjoyed the poems. Um, I, I especially enjoyed the poems about um, family members and all those stories. Um, and I, but I did wonder because, you know, I've got a great uncle who was killed in the war and I know nothing at all about him. So I, I wondered how much you, um, you felt you had to keep to what was actually known about them and how much license you gave yourself to embellish the facts. Yes, well there is a problem with poems which you probably know which is that you write them and they're rather sort of set and then you discover afterwards things aren't quite right but my grandfather was maddening. I think he was in the war for a long time. I'm so glad you've asked that question Caroline because there was something about the photograph I thought I might point out. Um, military experts may contradict me but on the sleeve there were several marks. He had a V, which I think means he was a Lance Corporal, but he also had a couple of stripes going down the arm. Now, I discovered almost by accident looking online, I think I'm right about this, that these were called wound stripes. So they meant he'd actually been wounded twice. So he'd been in the war a long time. Um, I developed this rather wicked theory that what people tell you, even if it's not true, is part of a record. Um, he probably was a Batman, he was very neat and so on, but the fact he insisted on it, I think got it in there. Um, I, as you can tell, I believe about the mules because there was no prestige about that. I was suspicious about the football on the truce because he knew that was a famous story and he knew people wanted to, to hear it. Um, I think I'm a rather wicked poet. I think I like a good story. Um, I'm probably, um, my grandfather's granddaughter in that, that respect. <laughs> Thank you. Very good, very good question. I mustn't encourage other poets into deliberate untruths, so we can always blame our grandfathers. And Kirsty has a question for you. Kirsty, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask away. 
Um, I'll unmute. I won't on. Uh, I won't turn my video on because my puppy is climbing on me at the moment. It's been oh, so how lovely! While I've been listening to the phone, it's been amazing. But that's why you can't. Go see on, Kirsty. Go on. We want to see the puppy. Oh <laughs> no, she's just like climbing on my head. And... <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the climax of the evening. <laughs> Do you really want to see the puppy? Please, can we see the puppy, Kirsten? Yeah, let me just let me just put some better light on. That'd be lovely. She was really enjoying the poetry. She was very chilled, and then she perked up oh. halfway through. Here we go. Hey. Oh, puppy! Oh, puppy! Little ears. Come here. Look now. Now I'm like, come here. She's no. Here. Oh, thank you so much. That was lovely. Um, here she is. Uh, okay. Uh, so my question for you, Alison, was, um, have you always been interested in saving these kind of almost lost narratives or people, you know, like these like histories that you could maybe call minor in a way, like, you know, uh, has that always been something that's interested you? I was always very interested in talking to older people, partly because there was a great rift in rural history. I was born in 1953. And my father had been a ploughboy. In, yeah. He started about 1940, 1940, yeah. So he was ploughing like his Victorian forebears, as, as Leonard Wright would have done. Then he came back to the war, was from the war, so wounded, uh, having seen Europe in ruins, I must say. And the horse is gone. The horse harness he'd been polishing for weeks had been thrown down the pit. There were tractors. There was an agricultural revolution. But obviously... I knew people who were still relatively young who would talk all about this. And I was always fascinated by it in a way I couldn't quite sort of pin down. Of course, at one level, the farm workers were very frank about the fact. They thought not everything was going the right way. They were very suspicious about the use of fertilisers, more so than their managers. So there was a big debate going on. So I was kind of storing up that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. it struck me even at the time that some of my relations, like Dot, who was very reticent, my Lincolnshire grandmother, would suddenly quite unaccountably at the end of a visit, tell you how beautiful the summer was before the First World War with a real sort of urgency, as though they'd suddenly decided they must pass things on. She was sort of giving me a toffee at the time, but with the toffee came this, this story. I think they were aware at one level. They were very bright people. They'd left school early, very skilled people. And I do think they, they had a concept of history. They knew it didn't record everything that happened and that they wouldn't be in it in any way unless they passed it on to something, and possibly to this slightly irritating, precocious granddaughter who wrote things down. So as I've got older, I've almost realised, I'm very slow on the uptake, that they gave me these stories in a sense, and it was my time mm. to do something with them. But poets beware, my memory is going. I know it's a little thing, but what was the name of the racehorse that the landowner rode around our village terrorising us? What was that horse called? I could remember it 10 years earlier so either write these things Sorry. down for me or write them soon because they will go <laughs> great question Kirsty. sorry I, I was kind of trying to unmute the squeaking toy but uh, oh yeah. great answer, so. <laughs> yes i um, love the tail i yeah uh, i i yeah i i asked that question because i'm really interested in these kind of minor histories and archiving as well i'm not sure where, where it comes from in my case but um really interesting to hear uh, in your case. So, yeah. I think it's completely in the culture. I mean, actually, people love telling stories. And my father's family were very enigmatic. They were Lincolnshire and rather quiet. My Buckinghamshire relations liked telling stories, but they were terrific mimics. And if they told a story, you've got it verbatim, you've got an Irish accent, you've got the <laughs> grand accent of the First World War cavalry officer that the landowner had been. And, and all around the house. Extraordinary. So I think it was almost in the blood. It was something people did. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Question from from me, Alison. Uh, while we're all buying and reading our copies of Thorpe Ness, who are you reading? Which which poets would would you recommend to us that to us are so far hideously undiscovered? Who are you? Well, I don't know if they're undiscovered. Um, I've always. I'm always thinking about this. I always have dread someone will ask me for the best books of, you know, 2022 or something. But somebody I discovered, it's not a brand new book. And I know a lot of people like it. But have you read Abir Amir, who is of Iraqi heritage? Um, her book's got a slightly odd title. I think it's Inhale Stroke Exile. 
but she writes very movingly and technically very well about her family's past in Iraq. And you'll understand partly why I like it, because it has things like the sour taste of pickles, which someone has tried to recreate in England. They can't quite get the taste. And there's a poem which is very dark, but very funny, about a heroic man who saved someone by not delivering letters. And she calls him the world's worst postman. It's, it's published by Serum. It's, um, I think in its way, it's an exemplary book. It, it crosses so many boundaries but I I, 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 re I read many things I like I, I enjoyed a book by Stephen Payne from the excellent happenstance press and Helena Nelson's book from happenstance um, about her family the Philpots um, Helen is a very gifted poet perhaps better known as a publisher but she's been writing for years about a family who live or well, couple who live really a bit like everyone in my street who kind of worry about their curtains and where they've locked their doors a kind of ordinary life that I sometimes think poetry is a bit snobbish about. And Helena is technically mm. superb and she writes about it so well. So have a look at Happenstance Press. Have a look at Stephen Payne, a lovely, elegant, beautifully written book. And Helena's Philpots, who are, are absolutely lovely, beautifully illustrated. After this broadcast, I shall think of um, 73 poets I should have <laughs> commended to you. But um, that's a start, isn't it? It certainly kick, kickstarts us. Thank you. Um, Jane has very kindly published a link to the uh, to the Inhale Exile. At it's Book. a lovely book. Yeah. And I read it at Poetry Wales reading last year. It was a very moving occasion. And we were all asked to say which book we liked. And I swear we did not conspire. Virtually every person mentioned that book. Perhaps it was The Welsh Connection. Yeah, I do. I do commend it. I must confess to you, I'm not reading enough at the moment, but... Um, Partly because I'm not travelling. I used to read when I travelled, but I'm I'm, I'm mm. buying the books. So I'll show you a photograph of my desk. <laughs> but <laughs> I will read. Do oh, you sound like me? I'm in I'm in trouble here. I'm I'm actually clearing out boxes and boxes of books to take to charity. Of course, uh, my, my to be read pile now extends down the stairs, which oh. given this is a three story house. Uh, it's becoming kind of a health hazard. There's going to be a really nasty trip one evening. And Do you know, this happened to a friend of mine. The result was not good. Yes, yes, clear those stairs. <laughs> yeah, good thought. Who will do? Who will do? Um, when should we expect uh, the delights of village? How is, how is Oh, dear. Uh, well, um, the, I'll, I'll tell, I must tell you briefly. The villagers revolted, basically. I, I had a plan for this book. Um, it was going to be about my Lincolnshire village. I knew a certain amount about that. And I had the sort of stories I've been telling you tonight. So there was going to be some family history. And then I was going to do a rather earnest thing of farming and various things. And I looked at various statistics and so on. And, and I wrote that book and it was kind of okay. But I did this terrible thing of going into family history. I did find some truly shocking and surprising things. And also very kind relatives have come who've told me even more startling stories. Um, yes, yeah, so you're looking at the descendant of a would-be murderer and a lady who used to have parties in the Windmill Inn with more gentlemen than clothes. So there's quite a lot going on in my, <laughs> my background. Um, so the villages have sort of taken over. So clearly I've got to get rid of the farming statistics. I've got to let all these villages in with their tragedies and their running away with a garden's boy. That also happened. Um, they ended up in Chich near Chichley, of course. So I would like to finish it this year. It's going to depend a bit on my Thoughtness commitments, and um, then it will have to find a publisher. But um, I hope it will find friends, because really, not to dress it up too much, it's in many ways a collection of stories, and I think we all, we all love stories. And I did find some interesting things out about the village as well. You can have a trip around the village. <laughs> Any, any other questions for Alison? Or I believe perhaps one last poem up her sleeve. Yes, thank you. The short poem. Yes. I'll, I'll wait for the screen, shall I? Yes, bear with me. Hang on a moment. No rush. It's a very short poem. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a lovely evening. The puppy was a highlight, but you've all been great. I'd like to end with a four-line poem. By accident, my poems sometimes bridge town and country. I was once in the country with a child who'd just moved from London. A startlingly bright bird landed on a fence. The child cried, 
It's a canary. But the bird was not a canary. I'm sure many of you have guessed its identity. If not, it will be revealed in this final poem, which is called Territories. Where lemon melts to mustard, its song a throaty clamour, to every month a new moon, each hedge a yellow hammer. Thank you. I think if we uh, all unmute ourselves and a final, very generous round of applause to <coughs> Alison for what has been a really enchanting, delightful hour. It's been another to be in your company, Alison. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for having been here and spent an hour of your lives with us. Uh, if you'd like to do the same again, uh, in April, we have an event with Luke Kennard, uh, reading from his Notes on the Sonnets, uh, which is the 26th of April. Uh, preceding that, on the 23rd at Westbury Art Centre, there's an open mic sonnets and soliloquies evening, uh, which is uh, obviously Shakespeare's birthday bash. Uh, details again on our website. And we have some uh, outdoor creative writing workshops coming up with Electro Roads. Uh, on the 14th of May, again at Westbury. All of the details are on the website. It would be lovely to have your company again. Uh, on which note, thank you, everybody, and good night from everybody and Kenneth Fest. Good night. Thank you. Awesome.